Uh, good morning. I will. Uh, uh, my name is Katarzyna Ochnik. I'm Mind Ripple, and welcome, all dear professors. Uh, it's very nice to meet you here, and thank you for your time. And uh, we know that it's very occupied time for you, as a healthcare professionals. And uh, we believe that sharing here is uh, very valuable to all of all of us uh, as patient and healthcare. And we believe that it will bring uh, value. Uh, I will pass to Professor Trufar, who will share with us, start and, and uh, be a moderator in this discussion. So thank you for this role and I'm passing to you. Thank you. So uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, uh, it's a great honor for me to be able to host this discussion. First of all, many thanks to all of you who have decided to join this event and share your expertise with us. We are very grateful for that. And I think that I'm speaking for myself, Professor Ofczuk and all intensivists in Poland. Thank you very much once again. And uh, I will start with a brief presentation of all of us here, especially our distinguished guests from abroad. So I would like to start with Professor Ziyang Peng, uh, it's our friend from Repub People's Republic of China. He's a professor of critical care medicine and anesthesia and the chair of the Department of Critical Care Medicine from the School of Medicine in Wuhan. Uh, professor Peng has visited Poland uh, recently. He was our guest uh, in Poland last year. We couldn't imagine what would happen uh, um, with the COVID situation back then, but now we are very happy to uh, have you here with us. Thank you. Then, of course, uh, another guest, uh, Jean-Daniel Shish, um, uh, former president of ESIGM and a member of steering committee of Surviving Sepsis Campaign, a full professor of critical care medicine in Paris Descartes University, and he's currently working in the medical ICU of Cochin University Hospital in Paris. <laughs> and I would also like to give a warm welcome to Professor Radoslav Ovchuk, uh, chair um, and head of the Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care of Gdańsk University, and also a national advisor, a consultant to the Polish Minister of Health. So, uh, I myself, I'm also an anesthesiologist and critical care physician, and I'm a head of the Department of Anesthesia and Critical Care in Lublin uh, University, and I'm also the head of the local, uh, local ECMO Center. So, um, I think now what everybody knows who's who, I would like to give you the opportunity to share all the most important um, facts what we have learned during the pandemia. And I would also, and now I would like to ask Professor Pang to give a brief um, talk about his experience with the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, Professor Pang, uh, you're welcome to start. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, hello everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for inviting me. So uh, I'm a doctor Pan uh, from the Department of Critical Care Medicine, Zhongnan uh, Hospital, Wuhan University. Uh, it's my honor to share my experience uh, with you. Actually, uh, we have learned a lot of the you know from from our patients in the in the last couple of months. Uh, today, my topic is uh, what uh, we learned from our uh, COVID nineteen outbreak in Wuhan. So actually in the, in the early stage uh, of the outbreak, we uh, need to prepare for the medical resources. So actually uh, the resources, uh, uh, including the medical beds, ICU beds, or the, or the medical professionals uh, are limited. So we need to mobilize the uh, uh, medical resources under the help of the hospital authority or under the help of the government. And we need to organize the new team uh, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for our patients. So especially the, we need to increase the, uh, uh, the, the ICO beds for our patients. The more ICO beds, the more patients uh, will be saved. 
So actually, my approach is uh, to uh, recruit the anesthesiologist uh, from our uh, hospital. So actually, my the ICU uh, uh, sites, the ICU beds uh, in my uh, hospital almost uh, tripled during this uh, outbreak. So uh, difficult for us to recruit the uh, intensive step, but we can recruit the the uh, physicians from NCC department. So actually, the, during this uh, outbreak, all, almost the the, the, the hospital uh, closed down. So we can we can recruit the uh, physician from other specialty. So my approach is the, to try to recruit the patients with the similar uh, training. Uh, with us, so anesthesiologist uh, is the is the is the best choice for for us. A lot uh, in your in in Europe is the most of the ICU uh, belong to the anesthesia, but uh, here in China we separated. So uh, uh, for me, the anesthesiologist is the top priority for us to uh, to recruit. So actually, other about the personal protection also. Is the top priority for the for our medical professionals. We need to prepare uh, all the PPE, including the gloves, the gowns, uh, protective shoes, and also the mask, the uh, including N95 goggles, uh, face shirt, and the hood. And also we uh, set up the you know, the protocol the protocols for the precautions of a droplet, a close contact and airborne. And uh, also we have the protocols for how to wear the PPE and all, how to take off the PPE. Make sure everybody can uh, follow the protocols. Uh, this is quite important for us. And also we monitor the ICU environment regularly uh, uh, to see how is the any positive virus in the environment. So this is all important for our ICO uh, uh, professionals. So uh, here I also talk about a little bit of the, the general features for our uh, the patients in the ICO. So as you see the, uh, you know, the, the people ratio is quite low in our patients. It's the only uh, 150 or 115. And also, the we measure that the the lung uh, compliance also quite low. Is the around is average is the only twenty two, and also the you know the IOS level also is quite high, and also uh, for for the patients almost almost uh, seventy two, seventy two of the patients uh, requiring the uh, intubation, so only only. Only a uh, 28 of the patients uh, can survive uh, from only the non-invasive me mechanical ventilation. For the patients uh, requiring the intubation, a uh, uh, small part of the patients also uh, switch to the ECMO. And the most of the patients uh, requiring the prone position ventilation. Also, the, you know, the four patients, uh, 90% of the patients uh, had severe ARDS and the others uh, complicated with the heart problems including the anemia and also uh, acute heart injury. So we also routinely uh, monitored the cardiac function used the uh, bedside TDE, uh, the echo, the, uh, the echo cardiography to see how the, the uh, the cardiac function in the, in the patients. And uh, 20% 20, 20 of the patients had the uh, AKI. So this kind of patient is quite sick in our, in our ICOs. And also the, uh, for the uh, key points of the ventilation. So, I mean, the, our approach is the lung protective uh, ventilation is quite it's quite important. And uh, we should uh, uh, focus on this uh, point. And also we try to uh, plan these patients as early as possible. And we evaluate the, you know, the, the parameters we set 
uh, for the ventilators uh, regularly, and to and to change if the if the parameters not uh, not appropriate for the patients. Also, uh, we titrate the PEEP and the tidal volume based on the the transpulmonary pressure, if possible, or uh, the driving pressure. Uh, keep the driving pressure less than 15, and the blue pressure less than 28. And uh, actually, uh, for our patients, we set the PIP relatively lower compared to other uh, ARDS patients. Almost uh, most of the patients, uh, we set the PIP less than less than 10 centimeter water. And also, uh, the acute core pulmonary also were common in these patients. I think it's the it's the induced by the severe hypoxemia. And this uh, and the severe hypoxemia induced the uh, pulmonary hypertension. So so this also uh, quite important. If the severe acute core pulmonary we are compromised, the left uh, ventricle uh, function, and we are induced we are induced the lower cut output. So if we give the uh, uh, enough oxygenation for these patients, this will be improved soon. Also, be careful of the long uh, recruitment maneuver. So actually, the set the high the highest people is the quite it's quite low compared to the to the patients uh, from other ARDS. So this patient is is, is likely to uh, to have the pneumothorax. So if we set the high level of the people. So here is the flow chart uh, for the ventilation supports we uh, we prepared for our patients. So actually, we based on the people ratio, uh, like the if the twenty to thirty or if the uh, around uh, one fifty to twenty. So if we people ratio is okay, and we start uh, from the high flow, uh, let's okay ratio first, and we just evaluate the, the this. Uh, work works a lot if for hours for two hours if uh, we based on the the loxy uh, uh, score lox score is calculated from the respiratory rates and uh, saturation and also uh, uh, also the you know the other parameters so uh, this is our uh, flow chart for the patients so but uh, if uh, uh, it doesn't work. We will uh, switch to other other models. Uh, also, we try to if for the uh, for the lung invasive uh, ventilation. So we set up the you know the IPAP around the eight to to twelve. EPAP is, is five five to eight centimeter. And also we we uh, we observe for about uh, two hours. So if the we, we see the tidal volume. If the tidal volume is too high, and then we will intubate the patients. So I just mentioned that we try to prolong the patient as early as possible, even the patient uh, still uh, consciousness. So uh, for the if we intubate the patients, and also we try to to perform the uh, recruitment per, uh, maneuver to see. The patients uh, to see the patient have the cap capability. So and also uh, we adjusted the people. So just I mentioned based on the uh, drive pressure. So this is the flow chart we set up for our uh, patients. And uh, for the ECMO, so if we tried all the you know the intubation for for a while, the patient still the the people ratio still quite low for 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 about uh, six hours. And then we will uh, try to switch to the ECMO. So actually we have uh, performed uh, 15 uh, ECMO already for our patients. So uh, half of the patients from ECMO, just uh, around the, uh, you know, so, so this is the uh, we we have learned from our uh, patients with the COVID nineteen. 
So uh, I fully understand. Uh, so you uh, what you are facing. So I'm happy to uh, take any questions from you. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bang, uh, for this very insightful uh, presentation. Uh, we will have a chance to ask questions and have a discussion on the topics you prevent, uh, presented later on. Now, uh, let's switch to another presentation. Uh, we have Professor Shish with us and now Can I have the next presentation on the screen? Yes. Okay. So, can I ask? Uh, yes, but someone has to stop sharing their screen. Uh, my good friend, uh, Young Peng, has to stop sharing. Yes. Uh. John? Hey, yes, 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 it's me, yes. Did you stop sharing your screen? Yeah, okay, okay, you want to, me to, sh okay, to stop show my screen? Uh, yeah. Okay. Which is beautiful, by the way, but. Uh, <laughs> so now it's okay? Yeah, it should yeah. be. Oh. So, Professor Shish, can I ask you to deliver your talk, your short presentation right now? So now you should have my screen. Can you see my screen? Not yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let me try again. Yes. Uh, now you should okay. have my screen. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. Good. Uh, so thanks for giving me this opportunity. Um, uh, it's uh, it's a great pleasure to have the, the, the opportunity to discuss this, uh, especially with my good friend. I was in one not long ago before it all started, uh, uh, Dion, and uh, none of us could have guessed that this was coming. And um, I'd like to follow on uh, um, the discussion that uh, uh, Professor Peng has started on uh, mechanical ventilation, because um, as we are still struggling to know whether there would be a, a, I would say, a good antiviral strategy, and that does not appear clearly so far, we still have very much to rely on um, the um, symptomatic treatment and uh, mechanical ventilation plays uh, a very important role in this, as highlighted by uh, Professor Peng. Um, whereas we all understand that there might be some slight differences between uh, ARDS for, from different ETRG, we, we also have to remember that we are going to ventilate and we now ventilate in my unit patients with quite uh, sick lungs. And I would say um, the, the strategy that we have developed and that uh, is, is deployed uh, over the country and uh, by and large over the large um, Paris uh, region is to follow uh, recommendations that have been published quite recently um, in uh, Annals of Intensive Care Medicine, which are uh, formal guidelines for the management of uh, res respiratory distress syndrome, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And um, in this um, uh, expert recommendation, we've came up in the end with uh, 15, I would say, sound recommendation and a therapeutic algorithm uh, regarding the management of this patient. And uh, I, I'll be very interested to uh, see whether uh, Professor Peng uh, would uh, see some value to apply this algorithm because what you uh, told us in the past minutes is um, very much in line with uh, what I'm going to propose in this algorithm. Um, the, the first and probably mo most important thing is really to focus on delivering lung protective mechanical ventilation to these patients. And lung protective means seriously 
lung protecting. And uh, uh, I believe that uh, uh, when you see what's at the bottom part of the slide, you can see that uh, following the initiation of invasive mechanical ventilation with sedation in the ICU, we are going to target a tidal volume of six milliliters per kilogram of predicted body weight. Um, and we are going to tolerate acidosis um, as long as the uh, pH is greater than 7.2, we don't care too much about the PaCO2. Uh, in Professor Peng's um, uh, approach, you, you were speaking about the, um, the use of um, non-invasive ventilation and uh, high flow nasal oxygenation, which um, for us has not been used extensively so far. Uh, because we are concerned about the potential for uh, aerosolization um, of the virus uh, with high flow nasal oxygenation and uh, non-invasive mechanical ventilation. And also because we know that in the most hypoxemic patient, it's going to be associated with a significant um, failure rate. And what I mean by significant is roughly 50%. The other thing is that we've been uh, quite impressed to see that uh, many of these patients do okay with, uh, I would say, three to five liters per minute of oxygen. And I would say all of a sudden they require more oxygen. And these patients that have, uh, I would say, subacute to acute deterioration of oxygenation are going to be quickly intubated. But for us, soon after intubation, we really focus on delivering safe mechanical ventilation with a tidal volume of six meters per kilogram of predicted body weight, a control of a, a plateau pressure. And indeed, we, we will start with, a, I would say, reasonable PEEP level. Um, and by reasonable, we mean we, they, they always have more than five, but we don't go directly to the super PEEP that have been discussed um, uh, and proposed by uh, some authors. Obviously, when the uh, patient gets uh, more sick, then um, this is where we have to consider uh, something more, uh, I would say, personalized for the um, uh, validation of PEEP level in this patient. And sorry. And for this, what, what we do is to focus on the more severe patient, the patient that have a, a PF ratio lower than 200. These are the patients in which we are going to try to use higher uh, PEEP level. And by higher, we mean that very often it's going to be beyond 10 or 12 centimeters of water, provided that we control the uh, driving pressure and maintain the driving pressure uh, below 13 to 14 at maximum. And uh, obviously, most of these patients will have to um, be heavily sedated. Um, that's sorry, excuse me. Uh, they will have to be uh, uh, sedated uh, quite um, uh, heavily. And the, the next thing that will come is. Je suis en conférence. Okay, um, what, what we'll uh, try to do is then to. Um, uh, sorry, as you can see, I'm clinical. So, uh, what we try to do is to um, find the adequate uh, uh, PEEP level for this patient. And for this, what we, what, what, what we do is to do a, a PEEP responsiveness test. And there are several ways to do it. Uh, our approach is to increase PEEP from 5 to 15 and look at whether you have a significant increase in the pressure PF ratio together with stable PCO2 and stable compliance. If you have an increase in PF ratio greater than, I would say 15 to 20%, while PCO2 remains uh, stable or decrease and compliance remains stable or increase, we believe that these patients are PEEP responsive. And these are patients for which we are going to target higher PEEP level with a maximum plateau level, uh, a plateau pressure of 27 centimeters of water while maintaining uh, the driving pressure below 12 centimeters of water. Even if this means further decrease in uh, the tidal volume. 
this is what we call in this algorithm the uh, maximal recruitment arm. Whereas patients that are not PEEP responders, patients where you don't see a significant increase in the um, PF ratio, or patient in which you can see that there is a, a sudden deterioration in PCO2 or compliance, these patients may not actually benefit from higher PEEP. And as Professor Peng uh, told us in his experience, in this patient, we really target a lung protective approach with uh, uh, six ml per kilogram and more or less follow the PEEP FIO2 algorithms that have been proposed uh, by several investigators before, like uh, in the NH uh, ARDS network. It's quite difficult actually to know whether um, uh, such a strategy is going to be associated with, uh, uh, I would say, uh, um, uh, whether this strategy is going to be associated with an improvement in survival. But this is something that we are going to test in a um, pressure, uh, in a randomized control trial that's called PESETAS, where um, patients will, that will be de uh, deemed res responsive uh, to an increase in PEEP will be treated like this, and patients that have no potential for lung recruitment will be rather uh, kept on the protective um, set. Finally, I'd like to insist on one thing before we, we, we discuss ECMO, that when the patient really gets severe, it's really important that we apply the recommendation and the recommendations are to keep this patient on neuromuscular blocking agents and to use prone positioning in this patient. I cannot stress this enough. This is probably one of the most important part of lung protection today in these patients. And uh, in, in our experience so far, I would say 80% of the patients have uh, received prone positioning and we have seen less need for ECMO in these patients. So these were the, the, the things that I wanted to uh, share with you and uh, I'd be very happy to uh, discuss this with uh, all of our colleagues and answer questions if there are questions later on. Uh, thank you, Professor Sish, uh, for sharing uh, this presentation with us. Since we in Poland still are on the rising tide, we, we still don't have a lot of experience with those patients because their cases are quite limited for now, luckily for us. I think we will move straight to the questions and answers part. So I would like to ask the speakers to try to type some of the answers for our chat module. And I will also direct, uh, I will also um, approach some of uh, all of you directly with the questions who, uh, which were sent to me. So I think we will start with Professor Peng, if everyone's okay with this, because I have, I have noticed that uh, there was a very high use of antimicrobials in your patient populations in Wuhan. Professor Peng, please tell me, uh, did you start the antimicrobials at admission or when a, a bacterial superinfection was suspected or diagnosed? When did you start them and for what reasons? So, uh, actually, uh, most of the uh, antibiotics uh, you were used prior to ICU admission. And actually, I, I, I don't... I. Personally, I, I, don't, I don't know uh, why they used the uh, antibiotics uh, initially. So actually, in ICU, we, uh, we will use the antibiotics if we have the evidence uh, the patient uh, have the, you know, the secondary infection. Uh, uh, we have the evidence suggests that we have the uh, increased increase level of the polycastonia. And also we have the... Uh, uh, culture uh, to show the patient have the uh, you know have the from the blood from the from the the, uh, the BLL and we, we have the positive culture result and then we will try to use the antibiotics for the patients. So initially, and if the patients stay in ICU for more than uh, at least for more than uh, ten days for the for the for the intubation, and we will. Uh, try to use the antibiotics for the uh, prophylaxis, uh, but only only 
you know, only in the, uh, for the, you know, if we intubate the patient for uh, at least for one week, and then we will use the uh, antibiotics for the prophylaxis. So this is the, for the, uh, we used, the, this is the indication we use uh, the antibiotics in ICUs. But usually, we depend on the, the situation. If we have evidence, definitely we will use, use the antibiotics, antibiotics. So if the patient has been in the ICU, is the well, is early stage, without any evidence of the secondary infection, so we won't use the antibiotics for the patients. Uh, thank you very much. And now I have a question for Professor Sheesh. Uh, there is a, a little confusion about the latest COVID-19 surviving sepsis campaign guidelines because uh, the recommendation 38 clearly states that giving antimicrobials is beneficial over not giving antimicrobials, even in the case of a lack of a proof of a bacterial infection. Can you comment on this, on the rationale of this, um, of this recommendation? Professor Shish, we can't hear you. I was saying uh, that uh, um, the, the rationale for this recommendation is admittedly quite weak. Uh, and, and I think that this can be, um, uh, I would say, adjusted based on your uh, attitude to diagnose uh, super infection in this patient. Our experience is that uh, the super infection is not that common. It's probably less than common, uh, less common than with flu. Um, and what we uh, tend to do is to use uh, PCT uh, on ICU admission and in patients that have a negative PCT, we don't give them uh, antibiotics. We may give them antibiotics if the PCT is uh, high while waiting for the results of the culture. But if the culture is negative, we will stop antibiotics as well. So I believe that the, indeed this recommendation 38 is probably going to fuel a lot of controversy and I would recommend, you know, I, I don't want to, um, uh, obviously, uh, um, I, I don't want to uh, underestimate uh, the work that uh, has been done and, and the importance of these pandemics. But it, we should not lose our brain and our uh, uh, habits of being good doctors. And being a good doctor means you should give antibiotics when you have a bacterial infection, okay? Not because you fear bacterial infection. It's not because you don't have a, a, a potent antiviral treatment that you should do anything. And the most important thing is to keep, you know, doing the right thing and apply some physiology at the bedside and uh, buy time. And it's going to take time. Most of these patients require, and I, I'm sure that Professor Peng will, will confirm it, they require, you know, 10 days, 14 days, sometimes up to three weeks of mechanical ventilation. Sometimes when you start to taper sedation, they worsen again. So no systematic antibiotic, I would say. And uh, in my personal opinion, uh, the heavy workload of the procedure might limit the availability of proper ICU treatment for other patients. But if you had uh, to name a patient phenotype suitable for ECMO uh, with COVID-19, who would it be? What kind of patient, in your opinion, is likely to benefit from VV ECMO therapy? So I'd like to add something. It is in our experience, when you, when you follow, and uh, again, we, we don't have uh, seen as many patients as Professor Peng today, but we, we've already done like 50. And uh, in our experience, the number of patients that need ECMO is not that high. When you follow the recommendation and when you actually uh, uh, set the right PEEP level, when you use prone positioning early on, you know, the, the number of patients that uh, get the ECMO criteria is not that high. 
Okay. So uh, could you please comment on the Oklahoma Heart Institute's um, prediction score for BD ECMO in COVID-19? Do you think that this might be a feasible tool for identifying the right patient? I would say, uh, uh, I would use the REST score uh, that has been developed by, uh, um, uh, I, I would say, the French and the ENZIX. Um, but again, uh, I, the, the algorithm that I presented to you, I think, makes a lot of sense because it's okay. a, a stepwise approach and uh, uh, it does not lead you to have a patient on ECMO that hasn't been in front positioning before. and. Uh, uh, I, I don't really believe that uh, uh, many patients should go on ECMO directly. I think that uh, uh, it, so far we haven't seen what we've seen, for instance, with H1N1 flu, where you, you, you see sometimes patients where uh, from day one you realize that their compliance is very, very, very low and that the pro pro proportion of potentially ventilable lung is really small. Thank you. And now yeah, I would I, like to ask uh, Professor Opchuk to, for, to give a short comment. Thank you. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is to Professor Shish. Let's go back to surviving sepsis campaign guidelines and the role of nitric oxide because it's, it may be really attractive uh, proposal for some individuals. But I'm afraid that uh, there will be problems with equipment in some places. So what's about postacyclin and ventavis instead of uh, nitric oxide? So, so the, the, the strength of recommendation for nitric oxide as well as from postacyclin is going to be very low. If you have access to, to nitric oxide as a gas, um, clearly the efficiency in terms of improving gas exchange is, I would say, more documented than uh, uh, prostacycline. And um, I, I, I actually believe that we don't have the answer. I don't know whether nitric oxide is useful or not for a this patient because all the studies that have been done have been done, uh, I would say, before the era of uh, lung protective ventilation. The latest uh, uh, PRCTs uh, published uh, by Taylor and colleagues in, uh, in 204, if I remember, or 2010, um, the, the tidal volume was 10 milliliters per kilogram. So uh, if you use a tidal volume of 10 milliliters per kilogram, nothing is going to rescue you. So if you have access to nitric oxide, if your patient is severely hypoxemic after muscle relaxation, after being put on prone position, you can give it a try. And even if you don't really have the apparatus to monitor, just using the smallest uh, dose available uh, may actually help your patient, especially if your patient have, a, um, I would say, some indication of right ventricular dysfunction or uh, right ventricular failure. Thank you. And the next question, maybe to everybody, is the question about high flow nasal cannula, because it may be controversial. It's advised, but uh, I'm afraid that it is necessary to perform this procedure in specially prepared rooms. So what's your opinion in, in normal condition? So actually, uh, uh, we are also concerned about this issue uh, using the uh, high flow lateral calibration. So uh, I, I prefer using this technique in the environment with the negative pressure because we, uh, we compare the, you know, the, the, the virus level uh, use uh, using uh, in the in the in the ICU environment. One is the with the just the regular uh, open the op, opening the window. The other is the with the negative pressure. So the uh, for the ICU uh, with only uh, open uh, open opening the window. So sometimes uh, we found the you know, the positive virus uh, nearby the you know the 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 machine. When we use in the uh, high flow uh, technique, so this is the uh, I don't think it's the it's the safe way for the you know, for this technique using in the in the in the uh, routine environment in the ICU. 
So this is the uh, I uh, we uh, we used so we uh, we we usually use this uh, this technique in the in the ICU with the negative pressure uh, environment. So uh, so this is the uh, we we uh, our our experience we use the high flow nasal ventilation. And also I uh, I don't think it's the this technique uh, uh, well because the you know. In our uh, ICUs, only small part of the uh, patients benefit from the high flow. Most of the patients, uh, uh, I just mentioned, the same seventy, more than seventy percent of the patients uh, uh, require intubation in our ICUs. Uh, only only twenty percent of the patients uh, uh, receiving the non-invasive ventilation. But a quite small part of the patients uh, benefit from the high flow. Uh, uh, the technique. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we also have some participants outside the, let's say, ICU anesthesia environment. We have some surgeons, and there is one question from them: uh, How should you, how should you work with a COVID positive patients in the theater? I mean, do you have any recommendations regarding? safe conduct of uh, any surgical procedure? I mean, apart from strictly anesthesiological uh, recommendations. Uh, I think Professor Pank would be ideal to start answering this question. So uh, actually in my hospital, we have uh, performed 80 uh, uh, cases uh, with the COVID-19. Uh, in our in the in the operations in the in the OR, and uh, you know we open a, a a room with the negative pressure, so this is quite important for the you know for all the uh, medical staff there, and uh, also uh, the, for the personal protection uh, depends on the procedures. So if the procedures, I mean, if the the they have some procedures. Uh, related to the, you know, the the airborne, uh, airborne uh, protection, probably they will use the the highest uh, uh, personal protection equipment. So so it depends on the procedures. So uh, so far, no any medical professionals uh, working in the OR infected. Uh, for the patients with the I uh, with the I uh, COVID nineteen. Okay, uh, Professor Sheesh, um, can you share some information regarding this topic with us? Or oh, students, you mean? No, no, uh, the um, perioperative uh, setting. I mean, uh, patient COVID nineteen patients undergoing a procedure, usually emergency. Okay, so for now, uh, I, I would say we have absolutely no experience because all of our COVID positive patients have uh, not needed uh, surgery. But what's okay. planned? Uh, yeah, for now, they, they really behave like medical patients and none of them did require any surgery. Uh, if that was to happen, you know, uh, uh, at least there's one thing where there's one place in the hospital where they know something about infection control and this is the OR. And I'm not uh, actually uh, worried that much about that, uh, that aspect. The aspect that worries us much more is when patients are, are discharged from the ICU and they can be extubated. Uh, some of them are still, you know, uh, I, I would say potentially contagious and we have to send them to COVID plus environments where um, the, I would say, uh, uh, training uh, for isolation procedure may not be as strong. Mm -hmm. uh, that's now, all. Uh, most, mm, yep. mm -hmm. uh, but that's an excellent um, topic for further discussion because we actually uh, had one patient who was ventilated for, for 12 days. Then his clinical condition improved and we decided to run the RT-CTRs and we got two negative results. So 
we decided to get him out of the COVID positive environment. And now, do you believe that this also should be a protocolized procedure? Because we actually do not have any experience nor guidelines on that. So how would you extract a patient still on a ventilator from a COVID positive environment? Do you have any, any recommendations for us? How would you do this? Professor Peng, you have the most important experience. For the, you know, uh, for the patients, uh, okay, okay, uh, could you say again? So, uh, do you have a protocol for extracting patients who are no longer in need of mechanical ventilations and are a COVID uh, negative. So, I mean, when do you make a decision to consider the patient no longer dangerous to, to, the, to the healthcare staff or no more contagious? Do you have a protocol for saying that this patient is no longer, uh, is no longer a threat to, to, the, to, the other, to, the, to the healthcare professionals or other patients? So uh, at least that we need to uh, measure the you know the PCR for three times. If all three times uh, negative, and the, the patient without any uh, symptoms, and also the, the CT chest uh, improved a lot, and then we will consider the patients as the relatively uh, low uh, contagious to other to others. So, if possible, we will also follow the you know the you know the antibody. If the patients have the you know the you know the the, the antibody is the IgG positive, probably is is, is is okay. Yeah, but but if the I mean the uh, consec uh, consecutive three times, like the, so it's a uh, it's the same for the patients. You no, know, with with without any. Uh, problem uh, of the, the transmission. Uh, okay. Uh, transmitted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, what you're saying is that uh, you we should uh, carefully monitor the clinical symptoms, right. uh, imaging st uh, studies, and finally perform the RT PCR or the antibodies. Right. So you should yeah, have RT PCR at least three times, negative three times. Mm -hmm. Okay, three, yeah. right? Yes, three okay. times, yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. And then this patient is declared to be non-contagious anymore. And also we need to uh, quarantine uh, for the patients at least uh, two weeks. And, okay. and, then, and, and then check again. And then still negative. Yeah, that's okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we have uh, touched the subject of um, imaging studies. Uh, what's your opinion on the role of uh, uh, chest CT scans as um, I don't know, screening tool or um, treatment monitoring? Is it really, do we really need a chest CT scan to monitor the, the disease? Uh, or perhaps um, a lung ultrasound might be a sufficient tool to do that. Okay, uh, Professor Shish, can you comment on that too? I absolutely agree. I don't, uh, I don't think it makes any sense to put this patient to the CT scan for, neither for diagnostics, okay? <laughs> the bugs are really small. They, are, they show better on, C on PCR than on CT. Uh, you will find ground glass opacities, yes, as in many other uh, disease. It's very, very, very common in patients with COVID-19 infection. And it does not really help you to set the ventilator, especially if you think what you are going to do is to set the most protective approach, to take the most protective approach. So I would not take the risk for a patient deterioration and dissemination of infection. We, do, we need time to make sure that we, we adapt our capacity to uh, face the number of patients that we get. because. Clearly, when these patients are in your ICU for two or three weeks on mechanical ventilation, you are going to face a, a problem in capacity. And this is really the thing you want to avoid. So don't do anything silly. 
Uh, speaking of supportive therapy, we have a question uh, from Professor Ofchuk regarding the CRT and AKI. Professor Ofchuk, can you comment on that? Yes, I would like to ask about uh, the acute kidney injury incidence, especially in China, and the role of CRT, the mode of this therapy, and the, the, the role in patients, not oligomeric <coughs> patients, with cytokine storm. So let's say, Professor Pank, I think you are the perfect um, person to answer this question. So actually, uh, uh, in my ICU, about uh, uh, around 35% of the patients uh, developed the AKI. And uh, of these patients with AKI, and uh, uh, half, of, uh, half of these AKI patients requiring the RRT therapy. So, uh, I mean, the, uh, the uh, proportion almost uh, similar to the uh, population in other uh, 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 ICO patients. So, I, uh, I fully understand that the, probably the, you know, the patients in, the, in Europe, you have the high instance of the AKI. And uh, I, I heard the, you know, the news, but I don't know why is the, the patient have the high instance of AKI. In the in the different populations, uh, we I have just received, sorry I, I have just received a message that Professor Shish is going to have to leave us. So Professor Shish, can you quickly comment on the role of CRT in your opinion in uh, treating the COVID nineteen patients? We see uh, I would say um, I would say twenty. 20% percent of all of the patients that develop um, uh, acute kidney injury, many of them because they came, they, they, they come pr profoundly dehydrated after high degree fever for a long time and uh, uh, high minute ventilation for a long time. Um, uh, for now, I would say that um, uh, 15 to 20 percent of these patients will require. Uh, um, extra renal replacement therapy, but uh, it's nowhere near the 50% that we've uh, seen and heard somewhere in, in the literature. For us, it's more 15 to 20% and no more. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to go. We have crisis management meeting. We understand. Thank you for your participation and see you and good luck, sir. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Okay. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank okay. you very much. Let's let's go on then, and we have another question from the from our participants. Uh, one of our colleagues is concerned about a situation when, which we hopefully won't face, but let's imagine that in a couple of weeks uh, we will have all our ventilators and ECMOs busy and running, and the patients will be still coming towards our doors now. What do you think might be a reasonable approach? We have already discussed this a bit. Uh, so a lottery might be one uh, answer, but do you think that we should be ready for such difficult times? Do you think that we, are, we can prepare for that? Or is it just going to be a catastrophe? Uh, Professor Peng, did China reach this stage? Or did you manage to, um, to avoid such hard and difficult decisions? So it's the uh, uh, actually this is the difficult uh, uh, approach, and also uh, in the early stage uh, of the outbreak in Wuhan, and also you know we've we've faced the you know the, uh, the the lack of the medical resources, and uh, also. Also, uh, we uh, we try to uh, try age uh, th these patients and uh, tell them okay okay you should stay uh, in at home you should stay in the temporary uh, shuttle and you should just, uh, you uh, if you have some problem you just uh, uh, call us and try to uh, try to avoid uh, you know rush to the hospital and this, and also you know in the we have a, a very difficult period in the for almost almost 10 days you know a lot of the patients rush to the hospital and they, they try to 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 think of the medical care but without any 
Like actually, we are we we have we haven't enough the space for the patients. So 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 this is the also the you know the problem uh, induced the uh, you know the serious the uh, 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 transmission in the hospital because the, all the all the the rush to the hospital and uh, so so this is the so I mean uh, if we can if we if the if the time uh, can uh, could go back and I I, I would ask uh, you know the patients. You know, first, uh, so we try to have, you know, the consultation uh, by the phone or or by the, you know, by the, uh, by the, you know, by the, uh, the by the uh, telemedicine, and try to avoid them to come to hospital. So this is this is a very uh, 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 critical situation. So uh, try to avoid the patient to uh, rush to the hospital. And also uh, for the for the hospital, we uh, we try to open uh, more medical beds, try to open all more the ICU beds for the patients to prepare the you know the, uh, the outbreak. So this is a, this is the we you know we we did uh, before, but unfortunately in the at least the ten days uh, uh, we failed, and this is the this is a big. Uh, Big issue to induce the you know the the huge number infected in the hospital. So this is I, I mean we, we try to avoid that the, the patient the try to avoid patient to the hospital, uh, rush the hospital. So this is the very important for the okay. you know the lessons for we learned before. I understand. And another we have a question from our participants regarding the routine use of neuromuscular blocking agents. Now, we have all been there. We remember the ancient times in critical care where everyone was given uh, these drugs. And now it seems that it might be feasible to take a big step forward. Now, what's your opinion on administering these drugs for the sake of the healthcare professional safety? Because you know, there are no clear indications besides the acute period, but now let's, let's face it, some of us will try to protect themselves by limiting the exposure risk. Professor Pang, any comments on the issue of neuromuscular blockades? So, uh, yeah. yeah, so actually uh, for, the, uh, for the trigger innovation, and we uh, fully polarized the patients, and uh, and also uh, we uh, we try we uh, we try to make all this uh, process uh, smoothly. So this is quite important to uh, make the you know make the patient uh, comfortable, make all the you know the uh, the physician comfortable during this procedure, and we we prepare a very good protection. We uh, we we wear the the hood during the procedure. I mean, this is for the for the trick intubation. But the, for the you know for the mechanical ventilation, uh, uh, we, we actually we use uh, much more uh, muscular relaxants for the for the patients because uh, these patients have the you know severe uh, problem, the, you know the lung problem, and if we uh, try to uh, adjust the, you know the people. I just mentioned the people. We said that it's relatively low, lower compared to the to the other ARDS patients. So if we set up, if we increase the people, and actually the 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 blue pressure increased increased more, it means it means the you know the driving pressure will increase, and this in this situation. We consider the the patient uh, so have the uh, compliance problem, and then we we will uh, polarize the patients, uh, and also of course we uh, prolong the patients, and for at least for you know for for the, for one day, and to see and to see what happened in in, in the patients. So this is the we uh, we use the in the for the mechanical ventilation. Okay. Thank you very much. And we have a quite a lot of questions regarding the monitoring of severity of disease basing on uh, immunological markers. Now, um, 
I think that that uh, um, CRP is not our best option, and of course PCT also. So, um, do you have any insight on the possible role of other biomarkers, which could help us uh, monitor uh, the progression or regression of the disease? Uh, any any thoughts here, uh, Professor Peng? So actually, uh, we routinely uh, measured the, the IL-6 level for all these patients. And also, uh, we found if the patients uh, with, highly, with the high IL-6 level, also uh, with the poor, uh, poor outcome. Also, we, uh, we monitored the, the lung uh, compromise. If the, you know, in the, in, the, in the first day of the intubation, uh, if, uh, if we found that initially the compromise, the compromise level is lower, uh, it also ind indicated the poor outcome for the patients. Uh, Professor Ofchuk uh, would like to add a comment. I would like to ask about safe prone positioning because it's uh, recommended method for uh, for these patients, I think that Professor Peng has huge experience in safe positioning uh, because it may be dangerous, both to, for patient and for our staff uh, because of this connection of circuit, uh, extubation, etc. So, uh, you know, of, uh, of course, we, we should uh, uh, have the uh, detailed uh, protocol on how to perform the, the, the prone position. And at least we have we 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 prepare uh, three personnel uh, for the you know for this uh, procedure uh, for the you know for the uh, prone position, and also uh, if the patients uh, have the uh, severe uh, hypotension, I mean requiring the dose of the lombardine more than 0.2 micro per kilo per minute, and then we think this patient probably is the hemodynamic and unsta unstable. And we we won't uh, prone uh, this kind of the patient with the uh, hemodynamic state. And uh, otherwise, uh, if we prepare well for the uh, you know for the prone position, and uh, uh, you know uh, we, uh, we we keep the all the all the all the line all the you know the the tubing, uh, everything's okay. So so this this won't uh, a, a big problem for us because we have. We, we, we have a lot of the experience to you know, before, uh, just before the outbreak of the COVID-19. Uh, we performed a, a, a you know, huge number of the prolonged position in our ICUs. I mean, this is a lot, lot a, a big issue, you know, for the, for the, for the, for the safety. But uh, okay, yeah, be careful for the hemodynamic as, uh, unstable. So if the patient have the uh, uh, hypertension, low, 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 low blood pressure, so be careful about that. Okay. What's about, what's about pregnant females, especially in late phase of pregnancy? Yeah, so actually, we, uh, I, I, haven't, uh, I haven't seen these patients uh, with the, you know, uh, I haven't seen the, pre the pregnant uh, lady. Uh, with the infection of the COVID-19, or also uh, with the ARDS, and we need to uh, prone this uh, this patients. So I so if for, if for the for the pregnant lady, so I I won't uh, prone this patients. Okay, and uh, w uh, w when we discuss the issues of potential problems and pitfalls of patients positioning. Uh, I think we should also mention the possibility that uh, CPR should be implemented. Now, um, any comments on that? I think it's a good question for Professor Pang. Did you have a chance to resuscitate, uh, to perform cardiopulmonary resuscitation in a COVID-19 positive patient? And um, do you, can, you, can you give us any, provide us with any details? So, uh, you know, actually, uh, we, 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 we had it before. And, uh, uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, the safety is, is, is still, the, the safety is quite, uh, it's the top of priority for our medical professionals. So, uh, so, so this is the issue for, you know, safety, you know, which we, we try to avoid, you know, the, 
uh, lot the uh, the transmission from the patients but during the, the procedure and uh, also i mean this patients uh, most of the most of the patients uh, have uh, have the you know the, the cardiac arrest uh, is due to the severe uh, severe hypoxemia so if we uh, if we uh, improve the oxygenation, the you know the patient is easily to recover uh, from the, the you know the cardiac arrest. You know, is it, so this is the uh, this is the, the point for you know for this patient with the COVID nineteen. Uh, I mean, the, we have we had this this problem with the cardiac sudden cardiac arrest because this this patient uh, with a long time severe hypoxemia. Okay, so uh, the general impression is that even if you attempt a CPR, it would likely be unsuccessful, right? Uh, uh, yeah, of course, of course. So it depends on the, especially the patients admitted in the ICU with the cardiac arrest. So for this kind of patients, it's not easy, not easy to recover. Uh, this patient because I don't know how long the patient uh, have the uh, uh, severe hypoxemia already. So it depends. So if the patients, sometimes we found the patients uh, in the ICU uh, also had uh, cardiac arrest, but this patient is easily to recover, you know, depends on the situation. But uh, can you can you give us any data, preliminary data, on the results of CPRs in these patients, or they are unavailable, unavailable right now? So actually, uh, in my ICU, we we took the the patients uh, uh, with the cardiac arrest, uh, you know, when the patient admitted the ICU. So for this kind of patients, it's, the outcome is always always not good, not good. Always complicated okay. uh, with the you know the the neuro uh, the, the neuro damage you know is the uh, such an issue you know for but if, if the patients uh, had the cardiac arrest in the ICU already and uh, this patient always is the is easy to recover is the also without any uh, any neurological complications. Thank you for this. And uh, Professor Ofchuk would like to add something. I hope it will never happen, but uh, uh, I'm afraid that there will, will be, there will be some places uh, uh, with the shortage of ventilators. So uh, what's your impressions about the usage of one ventilators to two patients? Okay. So does anybody have any experience? Uh, because we, we have some data on this subject. I think there is a company, uh, there are a few companies trying to implement such solutions. So actually, uh, we we are also concerned about uh, this issue, and we uh, we use the filter uh, when we uh, use the you know use the ventilation for the patients, and uh, I'm not sure it's enough. Uh, it's only a filter inside. Uh, so this is the. This is the issue we we concerned, but we don't know how to sort it out uh, for this uh, problem. With some insight on the role of steroids in managing COVID nineteen, because in in my opinion, the role is quite limited. Uh, do you agree? So actually, so this is uh, this is also a controversial controversial issue. And uh, you know, based on the uh, previous report, uh, the steroids uh, uh, doesn't work uh, for the for uh, for the you know for the uh, virus uh, pneumonia patients, and also uh, in our uh, guideline uh, issued in China, and also is the limited use for the steroids is only for the if the patients uh, develop. Is the you know the patient situation uh, deteriorated rapidly, such as the the PFO ratio going down rapidly, such as the uh, the patient you know the chest CT uh, huge you know significant change with, with one days or with a couple days, and then then uh, you then we are rec recommend you uh, try to you try you try the 
small dose of the uh, corticosteroids is around uh, one, one milo uh, per kilo, uh, like uh, per, per day, uh, for five to for three to five days. So this is the quite uh, minimal, quite uh, uh, low dose uh, steroids for the patients. Also, if the patients had uh, complicated uh, with the septic shock, of course, we use the steroids for the patients. But otherwise, we should be uh, we should be cautious for the steroids use for our patients. Okay, so uh, I think that we have discussed most of the topics uh, we planned to. So uh, I think that it's time to end our meeting. I would really, really, really like to sh express my deepest gratitude to all our experts. Thank you very much for your valuable insight, for your time. I hope that together we will overcome this pandemic situation and we will have a chance to meet in a couple of weeks maybe months to discuss all the things that we have learned. And now I would like to uh, give the final word to Professor Ofchuk. So thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, your, uh, your involvement in our education. And I would like to appreciate our audience who received a huge dose of knowledge. And I would like to say, as, as it's a slogan, but it's very important now. Take care. Take care. Bye. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Take, take care. care. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.